Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, folks. No matter where you are in this fine land of ours, I am so pleased that you've taken time out of your schedule to spend it with us today. All right, so let's get right into it. I, uh, everybody, of course, knows me. I'm Daryl Prell. I'm a Finilisoft, but I'm joined today by Daniel Shapiro. If you don't know Daniel, you should uh, get to know him. Daniel is the Chief Technology Officer with LeMay.ai. These guys are rock stars at artificial intelligence. I brought him in specifically for that purpose, and I want to introduce him to you so you get to know him a little better. So, Daniel, with that, let's talk a little bit about you. You work in the AI field, and you've got some strong opinions because when, when I approached you about doing this, you actually said to me, Daryl, I've already got a presentation built. Yeah, so I've been talking to executives for a while now, for a few years, about how to build their strategic plan, how to think about AI. And so I have strong opinions. You have strong opinions. Okay, so we're going to get through this today. So that's the important part. So what we want to accomplish today is pretty straightforward. Let me see if I can advance the slide and we can talk about the agenda. Is We're going to talk a little bit about how AI works. Okay, so that's the first thing you need to know. Uh, the next thing is, uh, just and it's, it's just kind of level setting, all right? Because you can't talk about what is factual or not factual if you don't know, understand how it works, all right? So we're going to, we're going to Call upon Daniel to give us the, the lowdown on how it works. Next thing is we're going to talk about why you'd actually want to adopt it. Right? What, you know, what are the benefits to you? Uh, and, and to make this more real, we're going to give you some examples. And then we're going to go and get into kind of the mistakes and the propaganda. So stick around for the end, because at the end is when it gets really, really, really interesting. We're talking about all those falsehoods, those half-truths, yep. and those misperceptions. And we're going to call them out. Uh, and it's really not intended to be malicious, but it's to, it's just to get rid of the BS, as you said, and actually talk about facts. So that's what we're going to do here today, which is really, really exciting. So let's kind of carry on. And what we're going to do here is, so the question number one is, do you need to be worried about artificial intelligence? That's and I just kind of open it up that way. What are your thoughts? Is that a bad thing? Because I'll set the stage. Our marketing said, are you going to lose your job? Because everybody's worried about that. Right. So, again, nobody wants to hear this, but context is super important. If you're a truck driver, you will probably lose your job at some point. But if you're a babysitter, there's no chance in hell that a robot is going to be watching my kids. So there, there have always been software programs that were replacing jobs that people do. The economy is bigger than ever in human history. It's not that automation is a bad thing. It's just a thing that needs to be understood. So should you be, be afraid of AI? If you work in a job that AI is going to replace, oh yeah, that's not good. But there are going to be more jobs in the future than there are now. So right now, there are tons of job openings and no one to fill them. That doesn't mean, you know... AI is good or bad. It's just a phenomenon that's happening that some things that weren't possible now are possible, like counting stuff in a factory. It used to be like a guy would walk by and go like, one, two, three, four, five. Now there's a computer that can do that. So if that was your job, that's not good for your career. But there are many, many other jobs that are creative and qualitative. I don't believe that anybody should be afraid of like the Elon Musk kind of AI, the one that he's worrying about that goes... The world is going to end because computers are going to X, Y, Z. No. Um, more likely, the problems that will happen are because of poor software design and bugs rather than like super evil, intelligent AI that's going to take over the world. Like when you have a blind spot detector in a Volvo that puts on a little blinky light that yep. says someone's in your blind spot, yep. that's AI. But like no one's afraid of that. They're like, oh, good. I didn't crash into that other guy. No one's like, oh, no, my job disappeared. And most of what AI is doing today is just super boring automation that no one talks about. But that's really the main purpose of AI. Also, we're calling this thing AI. It's not a thing. It's a bunch of completely unrelated things that humans decided to duct tape together and go like, OK, it's all AI. But really, the natural language processing stuff is in no way all the way down to the bolts of the mathematics related to the other stuff, let's say classification using neural networks and regression, which was around in the 1800s. So we've just decided by fiat, humans decided, there's this thing called AI. But if you're a mathematician, you're like, no, there isn't. There's a bunch of other fields that have different names that you guys just stuck together because they work together in practice. So yeah, AI is not really a thing. And the threat of AI is far exceeded by the promise of AI. From all the applications that I've seen, yeah, like any technology, it can get dystopian if you don't have any rules. So military applications that go super out of whack. But we've always had this problem. With computers, we had the same issue. 
the allies used computers to break Nazi codes. The Nazis used computers to count people in concentration camps. It's like technology isn't good or bad. It's just better stuff keeps happening. So we're not going to see the rise of the machines anytime soon? Is that what Absolutely you're saying to me? Absolutely not. I, I wish we would, but the technology's not good enough. There's no Skynet so, pending no, to take no over? No, Skynet coming. Sorry. <laughs> if that's why you came to this talk, no. I hate to burst your Maybe bubble, they want but... Skynet. Who knows, right? <laughs> yeah. So now, when you see things, like for example, one of the things that rocked the world for a lot of people, and this may or may not be AI, but I think they lump it all together, is you know Google and they have their new capabilities where they can actually call on your behalf and they can intelligently send appointments when you're talking to your hairdresser or it's whatever wonderful. it might be. wonderful. It is cool. And it sounded so lifelike when you listen to it. Yeah, there are a few things I should mention. If you watch that talk real carefully, you'll notice they did not let the audience try it. They only showed you their super best, most awesome examples and didn't show you any of the mm -hmm. failure cases. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, that, those were recordings, weren't they? Or they were the actual live? They were recordings. They were not live. Right. That's why I so, thought. Also, there was a bunch of questions about informed consent and should you first tell people like, hi, I'm a robot. Can I book an appointment for this person? Or do you go like, hey, baby, uh, can I just book an appointment? <laughs> so b putting aside all the ethical concerns, that like super constraints expert system AI is wonderful. I don't see that as a threat or a problem in any way. No one wants that job of like calling up hair salons and booking appointments. And so if two computers can like just talk to each other and figure it out, dude, let's do cool stuff. So then let's make it more real, right? So in the sales and marketing world, yeah. if I'm a sales development rep, you know, my job is to take those marketing qualified leads that marketing's created yep. and to engage with them on multiple platforms. Could be social, could be, uh, you know, could be a phone, could be an email or a combination thereof. Yep. And I'm going to hammer you repeatedly, bing, 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 until you finally relent and respond to me so I can say, hey, you Download it. You signed up for our live stream on artificial intelligence. Are you real? <laughs> Let me ask you these questions, and I can dynamically adjust on the fly. And therefore, the role of the sales development rep is gone because Google's going to do it for me. So we know, first of all, from real life, that that's really not true. That sales development process is very, very human, especially in B2B, because you're making large dollar purchases. In the non-B2B world, B2C, you have a different problem where if people even suspect that you're fake – They'll just block you and go like, wow, that was super annoying. Robocalls were a thing in the 80s when I was born. And you know what? They didn't work because people were like, wow, you spent no effort. You committed nothing to this relationship. Why should I engage with you? Basically, it's more software. Just like a robocall was you know, software dialing a phone, AI is just a way to prioritize. So my thesis was on recommender systems, getting the right stuff to a person Netflix is my favorite example where like the problem with Netflix is not are they recommending the right stuff to you it's like they need licenses for more content to have what to recommend to you but it's an unsolvable problem no matter how perfectly mathematically they recommend me movies I'm still going to go yeah you could have done better and the same thing happens in sales where if I recommend a product to you and I'm trying to sell you something you could say like well this wasn't the product I wanted Maybe something else in your portfolio was the right thing to sell me, but there's never an ideal time for someone to sell you something. It's not like there's some mathematical way using AI to sell something perfectly. It's always going to be this human connection thing where you reach out to a human and you go to this human. You and I are both humans. Let's talk about this problem that you have. And if you hit on the right pain point, if you address their right problem, you capture that lead, turn it into opportunity, turn it into a sale. AI can facilitate that engagement, but a fully no humans involved B2B sale just is not a thing. There are marketplaces for like buying and selling grain where there's like, it's completely transactional. Yeah, it's computer, computer. Yeah. yeah. But that's existed for a long time. It has. Th that's not news. Decades. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of like the nuts and bolts of sales, I think AI can help, first of all, to recommend what's the right product <coughs> to sell, what's the right strategy to take. But in terms of like getting rid of the human, I don't really see it. Um, if you're like a really successful sales guy, you go golfing with your like top prospects that buy stuff from you all the time. And that's your thing, right? It's not like you have some sales call process to this guy who already knows you for 20 years. It's like, dude, we have this new feature. You want it? So that's it, not a computerizable thing. It's like the babysitter. They want you to talk to them at that level of sale. It's not like you're selling lipstick and it's just a commercial and, you, you know, the commercial and the person are just not talking. Right. Because it's all one way. Right. In enterprise sales, in general, 
it's human to human. That's just still exactly how it works, and I don't see it changing like the babysitter. It's funny, you know, on this, you, you said it's just a natural, you know, lack of a better word, evolution. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that's been going on for a long time. My wife and I talk about this on a regular basis. And uh, and she's not as enamored with technology, perhaps, as I am. Let's go with that. And, uh, and, and she'll make comments like, you know, social media is just undoing you know, civil discourse and, and, and all the wonderful things that we value so much. This is a problem we need to, we need to deal with this. And my answer to her is no, what this is, is this is an innovation that is generational that the society needs to catch up on and adapt. And I, I'll use the example of, you know, when the phone was introduced, people would say, we're not going to talk and visit each other anymore because we have the phone. I don't like this. Right. And then the, and then the, you know, the, maybe go back for a couple of decades, maybe television came out and it's like, well, never, we're never going to visit each other anymore because now we're sitting on our couches watching, you know, Jack Benny or whoever you want, you know, whoever was popular back then. So I said, the society figured it out, but it took them, it wasn't overnight. Yeah, it's disruptive. It's disruptive. And that's what this is. This is, I think what we're seeing now so visibly is AI is coming to the fore. Yes. It is, it is disruptive, but... It's just, as you said, so automating. Pop culture hasn't properly segmented the difference between AI research and AI in practice and enterprise. Right. They're two very different things. There's people who are worried about the future, and they should be, and they should be well-funded by the government, and they're not-for-profit. They're like think tank stuff. Then there's real-life AI. Like, you realize the thing that scans your check and reads it was invented in, like, <coughs> 1993 by Yann LeCun? Right. Not like in 2003 or in 2013. It's old technology Computers got better and data got better, but that underlying technology is not like new, and it was used for super boring stuff like reading checks. It that's not the kind of Skynet AI that's gonna like eat your kids. It just it's it does a super simple function and only that and nothing else. It can't do one percent different than that. It just reads checks. So I don't need to be afraid of that, and that will not evolve into Skynet. There's a different kind of AI that doesn't work yet. That's like more general AI. Yep, yep. That's in the researchy stage that we don't do because our customers are companies, and companies don't want to build Skynet. They want to build like robotic process automation. It's called RPA. Right. They want to like take their processes that use humans and make them not use humans. They also want to take their data sets that they spent time and energy to build big fences around, and then use it for something. All this like vertical data integration to like get value out of it. So companies are not automatically interested in making bad AI. It's more this future-y stuff that could be like 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years away. Not my job to figure it out. But that's the stuff where people go like, ooh, should I be afraid? Right. Self-driving cars, for example, will obliterate a ton of jobs. But I'm okay with that because like driving super long distances, falling asleep on the road and killing people is not... Not, not a good... It's not a super sexy job to have. No. So we know statistically driving a Tesla with self-driving stuff safer than driving a GM car without self-driving stuff because less dead people. Right. Now, you could count up the dead people on the Tesla side and go like, oh, look, two people died. But like, compared to what? Compared to walking? Right. So it, forward progress is going to happen. And AI is going to be part of that story. And this is not a sad story. So it, it's not a sad story. Yeah. There's a sound button right there. AI is not a sad story. No. All right. So let's get into the, the, the whole process of how it actually works. Can you talk to us a little bit and walk us through this slide? Okay. So random customer comes in, goes like, okay, we have his data. Uh, we want to do some AI stuff. Go. And then we're like, okay, step one, collect data, organize data, make sure data actually exists. Some people think that they have data. Turns out they don't. They have other data. Maybe they have a table for customers, transactions, but then they want to automate like their click-through process, but they don't save any of that stuff, and it all goes in the garbage, and they're like, oh, I have tons of data, and you got to go like, uh, no, you don't. Okay, so after the data collection, then you do some science-y stuff called data science, where you decide if it's worth automating this thing. So you look at some correlations, you do some math, and you go like, hmm, this is probably going to work, or probably not. Right. Um, once you have some confidence from the data science, they're like, okay, so this, this could go somewhere good. Um, you validated your ideas a little bit, but now you got to actually like, do it for real. It's kind of like you would design a car on a computer, and then you actually got to like make a car. Um, so then you go to the predictive analytics, machine learning, deep learning, whatever you want to call it. Um, basically, learning from that data to do the thing that you wanted to do, um, and then you then you deal with deployment. Like, how do you actually make it a server that like responds to requests and whatever? So each of these has like 
20 little pieces underneath it. But this is a high level of like how a big company does AI stuff. You make it sound so easy. I try. <laughs> so uh, total sidebar. If it's that easy, how come it took you so long to get your degree? And because uh, you're, no, no offense, you guys are just meeting Daniel today for the first time. He's a smart cookie. We've had the good fortune here at Vanilla Soft to work with Daniel for a extended period of time. And every time we get into the weeds, and, and I would go, my head hurts. He would look, he'll, he'll just look at me and he'd go, there, oh man, it's just math. Yep. It's just math. And, it, you know, it's just math to him. But, I mean, if it's so, so simple, you know, why has it maybe taken so long for this to become such a phenomenon? And why did it take so long for you to get your degree? So a few things. First of all, writing a PhD thesis is really hard. Um, <laughs> the second part goes like this. This technology, part of the reason it took a while is there wasn't enough big data. First, big data had to happen. Second of all, we're the beneficiaries of other people's largesse. So Google gave away these huge software stacks that do AI for zero dollars. That created the AI industry in a way. All these researchers, by the way, ton of them from Canada, just gave their stuff away. They were like, here's my code, it works. Yep. And that has created an industry. Otherwise it would all be like siloed up in super nerd labs in uh, the ivory tower. But no, it's come out into reality from guys like me graduating and going like, hey guys, let's go do something. Right. Um, the other reason that this has not gone faster is that this stuff actually is really hard. Um, but you have to be able to explain to executives who are our customer in an explainable way, why are they doing this? Otherwise, they shouldn't be doing it. So executives are smart in their own way. They're like, is this good for me? Is this good for my company? And if you can't explain it in that way, like take your data that's siloed, extract value, make more money, do better at right. your service. If you can't do that explaining process, then you can't do the project. <laughs> so simple as that. It, it has to be simple or else you can't do it. If All it's right. complicated, don't do it. <laughs> so. There you go. It's as simple as that. So we're already yep. simplifying AI for you. So there we go. All right. So the next yes, question sorry. we have was why? I and mean, we've covered a lot of this already. I, I do want to talk to it a All little right, go bit. For it. So let's say you're a company and you're like, do I want AI? So you got to think about like, why do I want AI? You shouldn't just go like, oh, it's fancy, so I want it. And so this is for context. We're talking like just a normal company, a manufacturer, a product company. We're we talking like <laughs> maybe a software firm who's actually trying to bring a product to market. So this applies to everyone from a startup to a giant company. Okay. This particular advice. Now, especially in startups, sometimes they're like, I want to say that I have IP. I want to say that I'm using AI stuff so sure, I can raise money, I can, so that I can exactly, go to market. Exactly, raising money. It's, yeah, yeah, so it, it's a marketing prop. thing also. Yep, totally S is. Some people just go like, I need to say I have AI. Yep. Because like, then people will buy my stuff. Which is why this webinar live stream exists today, because yes. they're saying it, and it's total BS. Yep. Yep, go ahead. So these are the motivations for people to have AI. Whether they actually do it or not is a whole different story. Yep. Um, sometimes it's the... Top level, so this is very common in banking where the top level guys at the top management say like, to the middle level management guys, go make us have AI. Yeah. And the middle level man management guys are like, I have no idea what they just said, but I guess they told me to do it. So I'm gonna go find people who can do it. Yep. Um, and what they're doing is ripping out a lot of the code they built for the last like forever and replacing it with brand new stuff. So for uh, AML, anti-money laundering, there's a bunch of new stuff happening or for KYC, like know your customer, there's now like reputation monitoring AI. So like, simple example, if Daryl's stuff ends up on the dark web for sale, the bank should be like, holy crap, free That's account. Bad, bad, bad. bad. <laughs> so that wasn't a thing before that like there was no software that could do that, but now AI is smart enough to like read the internet and figure it out. Um, that's just one tiny example. Some other examples are your company and you want to have a new capability that AI can do that you couldn't get before. I Self-driving cars is an example. It's not like self-driving cars replace some other kind of self-driving cars. It's a brand new capability. And so if a company goes like, hey, new product line, then they get into that. Another thing that happens is companies go, all right, I want to make my product or service better. So Amazon always wants to ship you stuff faster and better. They're never going to stop wanting to do that. And so they can use machine learning and lots of little pieces along the way to make the thing they already do better. So they're continually optimizing it, tweaking exactly. it. Exactly. And you may not even know that there's any AI involved. Right. right. But like everything from QR codes to any kind of automation doesn't have to be machine learning. Companies do. But if machine learning is part of that story, then hey, AI. Um, in general, 
if you can't, as an executive, if you can't tie artificial intelligence to some key performance indicator and how it's gonna get better, just don't do it, because it's expensive. So if you're moving bricks yesterday and you're moving bricks tomorrow and you don't need AI, don't, don't, do it. don't do it. And yeah. that's a big lesson that I want to cover today. And we're going to cover that. I know that. Which is AI is not the panacea. It's not, it's not going to solve it for every single person. It, and often it doesn't make sense or it's overkill. So yeah. it's about a selective application of it to identify a problem that you can demonstrate it will be better, be more optimized, more efficient, more profitable by doing that. Yeah. All right, straightforward. All right, so let's get into the physical next slide here, which is AI Explain. Now, you've covered this a, a little bit already, but now we're getting into lots of pretty pictures. So yes. talk, walk us through this slide, and for the folks at home, what I'll do is I'll actually zoom in on this for you. So I'm going to try not to, like, break your brain with math. Instead, I'm going to go, like, look, pretty colors. So the green stuff over here is about understanding text. So people write, Mary had a little lamb. You can actually make a program that goes, Mary had a little, and it will go, lamb. Lamb. Yeah, so there's a bunch of technology in the AI space that can manipulate text in different languages. For example, English and Arabic chatbot that's bilingual, that you can talk to in English and you can talk to in Arabic so, and switch back and forth. And it goes like, ah, I get it. So that's that's a cool capability. Yep. Um, then you have a bunch of stuff for data manipulation where if you throw stuff, like even very well-organized numbers into an AI system, it will not understand those numbers. You have to do some math to like get the data ready. And so this blue stuff is a whole bunch of how do you integrate data into the way that AI thinks. Um, the way that I like to think about it is that you can convert numbers into different spaces. So in university, they teach about like uh, time domain or frequency domain. In high school, you would have like different coordinate systems. So AI works on a particular type of data and companies don't store their data in this format. And so there's quite a bit of work in just switching from your database format, let's say SQL, into stuff machine learning understands and likes to use. And there's a lot of strategy. It's not all science, part of it is art to kind of understand what the AI is gonna like to jump on because the AI is the one actually solving the problem. The human is the one like feeding in the data. And so as the human, you've gotta go like, okay, if I tell the computer names of states, then it's gonna go like, I don't understand the, the connection between these states. Like are New York and California close or far? I don't know. You and I know because we're humans, but the computer has no idea. Right. So maybe if we turn that into like longitude and latitude, it can associate <clears throat> this information and do better. So that's an example of like, taking the database data and switching it into the data that the AI will understand better to do stuff. So yeah, that's the blue stuff. This red stuff over here is fancier AI that's actual models. So these things, uh, let's go back to 1800s or to Excel, where you have your a bunch of points on a graph and you make like a line of best fit, like a, a line just Y equals MX plus B. That thing is some of what AI is doing. I, it just says, okay, so the data looks kind of like this. I'm gonna make a line, and whatever the dot shows up, I'm gonna go to that line and say, okay, that's the answer. Right. Um, bunch of models that do that. For pictures, for different kinds of data, there's, in the stock market, you have time series data, like a bunch of numbers for each thing that happen over and over again over time. For video, you have like sequence of images data. So there's, all, there's different AI models for understanding different kinds of information. But in general, if you take a giant step back, the green stuff is for text, the blue stuff is for making the numbers work in the AI world, the red stuff is for interpreting the data to make predictions. So what's interesting about what you're saying is AI is not this one monolith. No. It is this collection, for lack of a better word, of all these different kinds yes. of modules. Yes, and there are about modules. 60 more of these boxes. I'm just trying to give a very high level view that goes, you should understand as a business person what AI can and cannot do, not how to do it at all, but just like if someone says to you, oh, I have 100% accuracy on this thing, just know that that's a lie. Like there's no way. AI doesn't do 100% accuracy. It's approximate. Right. Just like you're approximate. Like people crash cars. People are not perfect. Right. AI is the same idea. It's I was pretty safe data. driving, but it was exactly. only an approximate. Yep. Yes, I understand. So like there are some processes <clears throat> for which business people should not apply AI. Like in safety critical systems, there's a much, much higher bar 
than for playing the stock market or whatever because you can be wrong sometimes in the stock market and your portfolio keeps going up. Right. But in like a rocket, you got you're one wrong shot. once. Yeah. You're done. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. there are custom strategies for each of the like corner cases, like, oh, not enough data, special situation. Or, oh, way too much data, another special situation. Besides for all the corner cases, in general, it's just good to understand when people try and throw bullshit at you, like, oh, we do AI in our front end, and then you should at least be able to evaluate as a business person, as a non-technical person, and go, like, well, that makes no sense. Right. Right? So that, that just that Because your point detector, is it's always going back to the data in the end. It is going back to data in the end, but also just to understand that there are a lot of things that are not possible. Right. Um, so there's uh, one of the fathers of AI. Uh, he likes to give these super simple examples, like uh, Daniel walked through the door. If you don't tell the computer any background information, it will think that by magic I like crashed through the door and smashed it and then went through the other side. It's not going to understand the door was open. Um, because its language model only understands like words mean actions. Actions mean he walked through physically the door. AI still does not have that problem solved. Right. So we're getting there. It's close. But if you have a high-level understanding of like, okay, so that thing that they're proposing to me to do, these dev guys, that's going to cost $10 bucks. It's not going to cost like $200. That's important. Um, also, just this idea that like if there's an API that does X, you can't change what that API does a teeny tiny bit and get like X plus one. These APIs that are exposed by... IBM, Microsoft, Google, they do exactly one thing. So sentiment analysis, for example, it might be trained for tweets, but not trained for Facebook posts. And so the results that you get out from tweets look great. And you're like, okay, we're ready to go to production. But then your customer feedback comes in as Facebook posts and nothing works. And everything says sentiment bad when they go like, I love this product. Right. And you go to yourself, what the hell happened? And it turns out, well, it was trained for a very specific thing and yeah. nothing else. Right. So. Yeah, the, the thing in machine learning is just as a business person to understand what is AI good for and what are the giant pitfalls to avoid like the vacuum cleaner of money sucking all your money away. All right. So let's kind of carry on into the conversation because you've got some examples here for us. Yes. Number one, you've got define the vertical. Talk to me about this. Yes. So this is an example of not enough data. So you got the name of a company and nothing else. So imagine you're faced with this giant list of companies that you're going to target and you want to know like, what vertical is this company in? I only want to target customers that I think, that I predict, are in the vertical I care about. So we're talking here about top one accuracy, which is very, very specific. Typically, you'll talk about like top three or top five. What does that mean? It means, were you exactly correct? If you said uh, custom welder, and it turns out they were just a general welder, you're wrong. So can you guess, just by looking at the name, which of 127 categories, different verticals, this business is in by only looking at the business name. And what you have up here is an example, like Athletics Canada is a community association. Um, right, so we're here yeah. in the, the name column. Yeah, so what this thing does is, so we take the name, like Athletics Canada, we chop it up into little four-letter sequences and make those all into features, so like a huge amount of like little DNA sequences. Yep. This works, by the way, in like gene sequencing too, <coughs> same idea. You just take little chunks of DNA and you go like, okay, with enough of them, with a zillion of them, I can make like a representation of what is this thing. And so... Isn't that almost how they mapped it originally? They made a lot of those similar yeah, you know, exactly. assumptions, if you will. So Intelligent assumptions. we have a much easier problem because there's yep. no like biology involved. It's just code. Yep. So what we did is we took a giant data set and trained this AI model to understand these sequences means that stuff. So when you look at MaxMart as a human, you go like, oh, Mart, store done. <laughs> right. You know. So what we did is we did a split of the training data and testing data. So you take your, all your data you have. We had like I don't know, millions of records. Um, and we split it into uh, one set of data that you train the AI on and another set of data that the AI has never seen that you tested on to see like did it work. And when we get high enough confidence, then we, do the valid we did a validation. So this came from uh, Western Canada and we tested it on data from Eastern Canada. Okay. Um, what that means is that we had two steps of verification to make sure, like, does this predicty thing work? End of the day, the business value is that you can take a giant list of companies and generate things like NAICS codes. So you can know, like, what vertical are they in? Do I want to call them? Do I want to reach out to them? And we did this for 
a particular project where we needed to know, like, sort by type of company. But that information for small companies is really hard to get. For big companies, no problem. Google has analytics you can just buy on, like, any S&P 500, Dow 30. They're all big companies. But when it comes to, like, a little corner store, like, flows flowers. Right. I don't know what they do unless you have AI to, like, kind of figure it out. You can't do it by keywords. It's too hard. Yep. So... It works. And this is cool, right? Imagine if I am in the sales and marketing game and I want to go and target, you know, certain industries with industry specific messaging. Yeah. And your example, you know, I may only have the name of the company, but I can go use some artificial intelligence to go to probably do a best guess exactly. of the industry it's in. And it's not to your point, you said this before, it's not just gonna be hundred percent accurate, yeah, but it's gonna be darn close. Yeah. And from an efficiency like, point of view, that's brilliant. Sixty percent accuracy just means you spent less time on stupid things. <coughs> it exactly. focused down the sales guy to do a better job. It, and again, it didn't replace the sales guy. It just made him better. Right. All right. So let's go on to example number two. Example number two was segment the contact. So talk to us about this. Yeah. So this particular thing is actually, I read a bunch of posts on a blog on Medium uh, in what's called Towards Data Science. And I had this theory about what I'm writing. And I said, okay, some of the stuff I write, it's content marketing. So we're getting like uh, top ranking on Google for certain uh, search terms like uh, AI data set stuff, uh, how to price an AI project. And so if you just Google that, we're showing up as like number one. If you Google- And by the way, this is true. I did it. He shared it the other day on LinkedIn was yep. how to price an AI project. Yep. And like an ass, I said, <laughs> I don't to do it. You. I'm going to do it, right? <laughs> and initially I didn't think it was, when I looked at it, I was like, oh, that's not it. Because you were using some other domain name I was looking for. I was expecting to see yeah, domain. So that's the, you're seeing the blog posts, you're, the right. content itself. And I started to, I was sort of, as you started to write you saying, doesn't work for me. Here's my screen capture. Yep. And I thought, let me just drill down. I'm like, oh shit, he's right. So, yep. so, uh, if so you I was, I was it, so it's proud a picture of, of me. Yeah, it is. I was, I was very impressed. You nailed it. Yeah. So the, the strategy there was, to do three things, write technical articles, write non-technical articles, and write medium sort of half and half articles. Yep. So that's these three colors, blue, yellow, and red. And my theory was that if I'm right, the AI should validate that what I think I'm doing, I am doing. So this thing that you're looking at was the AI basically telling me if it agrees with what I think or not. What you would expect is that each of the colors of the stuff that I would do would be together, and that's what happened here. So we got the blues together, the yellows together, the reds together, and the progression from technical to non-technical worked out. So this is an example of doing segmentation based on content to get the AI to do its thing. That's so cool. All right, so let's go. Uh, let's go back here. Let's go on to the next slide. Now you've you then start actually doing combinations. This is what gets pretty interesting. So talk, talk to me about this. Yeah. So you. It, that four-step process we looked at earlier, you can actually do a bunch of them together. So you get in the data, do some data science, validate your idea, do customer segmentation so that now you have the data and you have like cluster IDs for your customers, and then you can recommend stuff to your customers. So these different AI projects can build on each other to get fancier and fancier in terms of like their predictive power and the features that they can do. I Did just, that make any sense? It does make sense. <laughs> I'm almost, okay, and for those who know me, I'm rarely speechless, but I listen to you and you make it sound so freaking simple. And I just want to slap you. And then nothing personal. You understand that, right? <laughs> Don't do it. It touched me. <laughs> but you are, I mean, that's the whole point, right? I, what, I, what I was excited about in this, this production was that we were going to simplify the conversation and make it understandable. You know, to me, I can bring it back to say, you know, this is Daryl speak. You talked earlier about all the different ways, the modules you talked about. And to me, they're just, and don't beat me up because you're the AI expert and you know what I'm going to say is just a layman's Do misrepresentation. It. It's just a bunch of rules and algorithms to a degree who are assigned a specific task, for lack of right. better words. That's actually correct. What's wrong with that? I got one right, guys. Way to go. <laughs> All right. So let's move on. Uh, Gold star. I'm going to celebrate that. And this is uh, the recommender system, because you said that was your PhD. Talk, yep. talk to me a bit about that. Okay. That so process for you. It was hard and long. Um, so the idea is like this. <clears throat> My dissertation was on you have your computer screen and an AI that's like an eyeball that just looks at the computer screen. Think of it like a video camera that sees just the computer screen. Yeah. And it had to figure out, what should I recommend to you to do? Do you want to open an email to Daryl? Do you want to like open a website, what do you want to do? And then it would just be a little icon you can click on. 
that has like a picture of the thing that it's recommending and like a t- teeny tiny bit of text. Yeah. And that's it. And that was the whole project. So doing that is really hard, but it works. So they give away PhDs that easily? Is that what I'm hearing you say? The I bar's know. down here? Way down there. Uh, it's a good thing I didn't try because I, I would have been bored, clearly. So let's go with that. <laughs> all right. So now, despite all this, there are mistakes. Yes. So the, talk to us about the mistakes. Okay. So the mistakes come in two flavors. One is mistakes from the company side. The other is mistakes from the machine learning side, from the like consultant side. The companies come in like three flavors of bad. One is... I have no data. I think I have data, but I don't have data. The other, and this is on the company side, the other is, okay, I want to like cost constrain my project. The government loves to do this. Sorry, government of Canada, where they're like, okay, so we're just going to skip that step. And I'm like, but that step is very important. Yeah. (laughs) So you can't just like build the rocket, never mind the thing that goes on the end of it, fairings, who cares, and just shoot it and hope it works. Um, There are lots and lots of pitfalls of skipping steps where a company or enterprise will get very excited and like, ah, and then they're stuck and they're like, wait, why didn't it work? And it's because like you skip steps for, and usually it's for like project management reasons and that's a dumb idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, the really bad one is bad requirements. So you have someone who calls you up and they're like, so I want you to quote me on this project to like make money in the stock market. And I'm like, so do you have like any idea? And they're like, no, 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 just, just make me make money. And I'm like, but no, so yeah, bad requirements. Um, they come in a million flavors. I bad requirements are bad. Bad, <laughs> I, <laughs> bad requirements are bad. I can't beat that. I'm going to move on from that. All right, this was the slide I was most looking forward to, guys, um, with today's conversation. This is where we we start to get into the essence of the title that we share with you: truths, half truths, or misperceptions, and uh, and outright lies. So I've called this slide propaganda. Yes. All right. And I've said it out there. So let's talk. We've already talked about the, up to now, everything's been truths. Yes. All right. How it works and, and how you can combine them into combinations and there are going to be mistakes and how you should be using it and how you should ex- you know, expect it to work. And you shouldn't be worried about it long term. And it's just, uh, you know, here are the benefits and this isn't new and all that kind of stuff we covered off. I did pretty good there in the kind of my impromptu re- recap. Look Feel. at that. I'm yeah. like, whew. All right. But now we're getting into the other part, right? The the half truths and the and the outright lies. So yep. talk to me about examples of half truths, if you will. Yes. Maybe I don't want to call it false outright falses, but you know we're gonna get down and dirty. Uh, we're gonna let's, let's okay. Over to you, big guy. Okay. So um, <clears throat> sometimes we'll come in as like the second person to work on a project. Yep. Where the first group of people did some really nasty things. And I'm going to stop there for a second, right? Because so LeMay, for context, yes. when you say you're coming in as a project, your organization is, it, it, tell, yeah, so tell we, the world what do, you do. Yeah, enterprise AI consulting. So we help companies to do AI. Um, on a micro <laughs> level, so we've, we're the uh, in-house AI <coughs> consultants for the city of Ottawa. Okay. So we go to Invest Ottawa and like advise companies how to do AI stuff and help them to like get AI capabilities. And we get from them, like especially from little companies, horror stories. Because big projects, big companies, they have a tendering process. They, they tend to make it out okay sometimes. Yep. But little companies are somewhat defenseless. Yep. In a supply-demand mismatch, prices go way up. So right now, transiently for the next maybe year, but looking back like a few years back, there's just way more demand for AI than supply of AI consultants to companies. Right. They can't hire a whole AI team. And so what happens? They, they're they like the redheaded stepchild. They just get beat down on all the time. And people who don't know what they're doing just try and separate them from their money. Now, we've seen really interesting bad stories like a big consulting firm goes to a small company and goes, what's your market size? How much money you got? And that's basically like a really nice way of saying how much money can I take from you? Yeah. It's not about like bottom up, what is the pricing? It's about top down, how can I rob you? It's a really nice way of saying that. But so I've seen a lot of these bad stories happen in the consulting world. And that leads to general mistrust. It doesn't have to be like the blockchain world where it's just hype and the amount of value is small, but the amount of like money going into it is huge. Yep. Um, in the AI world, there really is a lot of value, but there are people who, like, 
try and look like they know what they're doing, even though they have no idea. Right. And then they'll sub out a project to someone else. Or So a lot of these firms will represent that they have AI capabilities. Yes. And they'll bid on the business. It's part of a bigger project. We do A, B, C, and oh, by the way, D, some AI. Exactly. And and then you That's say- very common. You've got the project. You you know you won the tender because you, you can do it all. Yeah. But they have no AI experience or very minimal. And then they come and they outsource it. Exactly. So- it, some companies are really good at writing responses to RFPs, yep. but they don't actually do work. They kind of sub it out. That usually works in like regular software, like user interface design or like scheduling something yep. because it's software. It's a fixed thing. You just, you know, take your cut, pass it on. In AI though, sometimes they don't have the ability to perceive like, man, it's a $10 million project and they quote it for like a million bucks. Right. And then they're trying to farm it out for like, 800000 or $700,000, yep. but it's really a $10 million project, and they just didn't know how to do the costing to scope it out properly. So we have a process that, like, NDA, statement of work, blah, 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 going through all the steps where we carefully make sure that we know how to do the project or that it's research and that we're getting paid hourly or whatever, but some of these companies don't care, and they just go. Um, or worse yet, they'll run out the clock. So... The worst thing that I've seen is people who are like charging by the hour, but they don't know what they're doing, so it takes them a lot of hours. Right. So, for example, if you have a client that says, I have this requirement, this happened to me a few weeks ago, where the guy said, I need a correct grammar in English language. And I'm like, okay, here's a library, done. Yep. I'm not going to charge you for that. I'm going to make that into a project. Right, it already exists. Yeah, it exists. Just yeah. use it. Um, I've seen people who don't do that. Right. <laughs> and they're like, oh, sure, I can... Data collection, predictive analytics, and... So maybe the half-truth in this case is there are vendors out there uh, who are representing they have a capability, and you need a capability, and you seek their counsel, you seek their services, and they're actually not capable of yep. understanding the needs. They can't scope it out right. They charge it wrong, and then they have to outsource the actual product, but because they've done it wrong in the first place, they don't get the right talent they need with the right skill sets because they have a certain price point they have to get into. Exactly, and I feel like one of the ways to overcome that is to ask for reference clients. Right. So we were kind of forced to collect a whole bunch of like uh, support letters from previous successful projects yep. because we bid on this big project, and they were like, nah, support letters. So hey, now we have all this nice stuff. Right. So. Uh, if you're dealing with, like, one guy who's the whole shop, it's really his job to do every job. One of them should be, like, get support letters from previous stuff. Make sure that that person has, like, a degree from a good university, previous successful projects. Like, the checks enough boxes that you know that you're not going to get burned. When you're dealing with a firm, so I'm not just, like, a guy with a company. It's We're, we have a whole team. Um, at, at that level of project where you're doing, you know, 100K-plus projects, what you want to do is two things. First of all, like the people that you're working with yep. because a lot of it is not technical. It's interpersonal. In the AI world, stuff is really complicated. And so if people are not effective communicators, you're boned. It's not about like being the smartest person in the room. It's being about the best communicator and being able to deliver the project. So when you're evaluating a team to say like, okay, I want to do this AI project, the way you can cut through a lot of this BS is first of all, know the bad stuff that they're doing recognize the patterns of the guys who are bad. And second of all, ask them for references, right. just like you would for a contractor on your house. Because right. in the same way, you don't trust those guys either. So that's a lesson learned. That's, you know, shall we say a misrepresentation, a half truth, in many cases an outright lie, if I'm trying to seek an expert to help me implement an AI project. Yeah. What else do you see out there? So scope creep. Um, usually this is on the client side. So you, like you have a client who's like, ooh, it's so great, I want to do more. And like, we have provisions for that, no problem. It's like, yep. hey, more money, more features. The problem is when it's on the contractor <coughs> side. The guy, it's like, think of a guy who's doing kitchen work for you. Yep. And he's like, this is gonna be a 10K kitchen. And then he's almost done and he's like, oh, this hose, this thing, I just, it needs to be bigger. Let's make it 20. Right. And that is not cool. So like that happens sometimes out of dishonesty where they're like, oh, if I go in for lower money, then like maybe I can- get the I can, job and then yeah, I can upsell them. Exactly, so like bad. and the way that you prevent that from happening is get references from previous good clients and look at their ratings online from how long have they been in business or whatever. It's standard stuff, but in any industry with a lot of hype, like big data was the previous big wave of hype, you had people who said like, oh, I do big data. Do they use the right big data tools? So in the AI world, are they using the right AI tools? Um, you can easily Google like, oh, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch. Like there's yeah. a set of tools that they should be talking about 
that if they're not using those tools, if they're using just like vanilla Python, be very afraid. So it, it's good to have someone to help you find the right person. So clarity, when you say vanilla Python, we're not making any reference at all to vanilla soft, completely <laughs> different. All right, so I like that first one. First one was, you know, claims that are uh, overstated. Second one is scope creeps. You get enamored with the price, but the reality is they probably got in low and they're gonna yeah, add there's on. There's always to someone who will do cheap work. The, the next huge problem yep. is basically people who are incompetent. So uh, like offshore now, projects- you're not talking to me, just so we're clearing this. I'm talking directly to you. Oh, um, damn it. So, so. there, I, I don't wanna pick on a particular country, but I've had better experience in Eastern Europe than I have in South Asia. Okay. Um, I think it might be because of communication barriers. I don't know, but like big picture, I haven't had great success in outsourcing stuff. As you know, we have a physical office with humans who sit in it. Yep. And I would love to like lower cost outsource things. It doesn't work though. Like you need a team who's on one room with a whiteboard and because there's something like AI. I mean, that, that can get pretty hairy pretty fast. Yes. Because to your point about you walking to the door, there's a lot of details that just got lost in that one example. Yeah, context. Context. Well put. Context. That's difficult to kind of, you know, ruminate over and develop when you're distributed and there's time zones and there's delays. Yeah. So <clears throat> part of it, I don't think it's really time zones. I think part of it is that the person on the other end may not know what they're doing. So I was talking to another person in the industry who has another AI company. We were at a conference a week ago. Yep. And they basically said, don't pick on this particular country. You just dealt with a bad person there. That country is so big that, you know, there's for every 10 guys who don't know what they're doing, there's 10 more who do know what they're doing. That's fair point. But yep. in terms of like quality control, you it's don't want to- It's tough for you to know, right? Yeah, you don't want to solve that problem. This is not your problem. You have your own problem. Right. I don't want to go in the 50-50 chance that I got a good guy exactly. versus a bad it's guy. It's just not worth the effort. It's not worth the risk. Yeah. Especially something like that. It's your point. Yeah. So it, it is hard, though. And keep in so mind- So more like, reference checks, I think, is in the end. Yes. But we're also competing literally with like Google and Facebook and like for the same these big talent. banks for the same talent. Yeah. So our employees had signed job offers from those places- and had to pick us. So our pitch to them was, you're going to get to work on the coolest stuff on day one, not like we're going to pigeonhole you into a small project and right. you're stuck there. So yeah, on the talent side, if you're looking to build a machine learning team, um, it's doable, but it's hard because let's say you're in a really boring industry, like I don't want to pick on insurance, but insurance is really boring. Um, it's hard. <coughs> it's hard to get the talent to do it. And that's why you end up calling up consultants and saying like, oh, we can't find the right people who have the experience in it and do the thing. Yep. All right. That's, yeah. So that's the next one. So I love how we're doing top down. So uh, we had the big picture claims and then we had uh, um, scope creep. Uh, and then we got down to the actual kind of, let's say you're probably better off by having people all in the same locale who yeah. are verifiable as capable and, and successful and accomplished as opposed to a distributed team. Yeah. Vaporware is, is possibly the worst. Vaporware is a big part of my outright lies section I want to yes. talk about. So talk to me about vaporware. Okay. So typically what will happen is a product manager will get like a <coughs> spec for a project and they'll design it as if it works. They don't know anything about machine learning and they're like, I'm going to do the AI marketing. And then they go like B2B try and upsell this thing to as like a pre-sales technique or as an upsell from a product that they already have. And they don't actually have this thing, but it turns out then they turn around once they like have a bunch of like signed up customers and they're in a panic to make this thing. Unlike regular software that you can do that pattern, it's not, it's frowned upon, it's not a nice thing to do, but in regular software, you could feasibly do that. In AI, you can't because you probably spec it wrong. And even if you didn't spec it wrong, it's really, really hard to know if your idea is gonna work in ML before you do the data science, the data collection. So I have personally had the experience of companies both in Canada and in Europe and in the States, this is a common thing, that are like in a panic for making me this product. And part of what they designed is impossible. It's just like provably impossible. So they've already sold something that it's not just that they can't deliver, no one can deliver. Yep. Um, that's really bad. <laughs> so especially when you see like AI marketing stuff, it needs to be paired with AI capability stuff. Ideally, if you're a, 
accomplished big company already, don't call it AI. Just make it a good feature. A any technology that's sufficiently awesome just seems like magic. So just make a good product. If it happens to use AI, you don't have to like stick a huge AI sticker on it. If you're a bank, let's say, and you have like a predictive thing of how much money do you think your customer is going to spend, you can like just stick it in the UI. You don't have to say like, ooh, AI feature, whatever. Just do your thing. So whatever company, if what you see is only marketing and no actual features, either it's because they don't actually have any AI and they're just like, they like marketing that they have AI. Yep or that the AI that they have doesn't really add to their product. It's sort of like a side point that doesn't make their product awesome. It just, they check the box that they have AI. All right, so here's a couple things that I want to drill down on before we wrap things up. We're, we're down to our final five or minutes or so. So fast and furious. Uh, number one, what about users who seem to think, I want to invest in this vendor because they claim to have AI and the benefits they're claiming are going to make my life so much easier, even though... I think a lot of that is hearsay. A lot of it is subjective. A lot of it is wishful thinking. In my opinion, they're they're buying into the claim. I totally agree <clears throat> that humans like brands. It's a shortcut. It's a heuristic for actually doing your homework. People are not suddenly going to be not people and do their homework. They're going to like Google over Microsoft because of some UI feature that's nothing to do with the main capabilities. We can't change what people are, but having AI or not having AI is not generally what's gonna make a company successful. Sometimes, as we talked about, the company doesn't really have AI at all, it's all right. marketing, it's not real. What people should be doing their evaluation on is features. When we sell enterprise software, like in the audit space, we have a bunch of like stuff that we're selling to the C-suite, and so we talk to them about capabilities. That's how you should really sell this stuff, because if you have capabilities other people can't do, it's better than just saying AI, because what does AI do? What you want to say is you want to sell the what it does, and that that thing that it does should be better. If they're selling you on the message of like, ooh, AI, not like, ooh, better lead contact, or some kind of key performance indicator that will be better, it's because they don't have what to say, right? right? So I generally agree with you that there's too much hype. I think that there is a lot of progress to be made in the industry of actual cool technology. But as with everything in AI, once it works really well and everyone knows how it works, they don't call it AI anymore. Like there's tons of AI and spam filtering, but they call it spam filters because it works now. Right. So as soon as something is not researchy anymore and now it's just like a thing, they stop calling they it stop AI. Calling AI. So one of the things you you talked, we talked about this offline before we went live, and you said AI is only as good as the data set. The Absolutely. size of the data set. So, you know, I'll use an example. You know, we're a sales engagement vendor, right? So if my users in you know, company A signs up for Vanilla Soft and they've got three people and they're making 30, 40 calls a day. So we're not talking – it's going to it's going to take a while before we have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of attempts to reach somebody before I can start to statistically um, – make some artificial intelligent applications. It's not gonna happen day one, or day 10, or day 100. So there are a lot of asterisks, asterisks. Yep, yep. What's your preference? Yep. Um, one of them is you can actually aggregate data from <coughs> lots of different users and then get general patterns, for example, by vertical. Another example is you can join outside public data with inside private data to get a bigger data set. My example would be in real estate. Let's say you have a listing and you have number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms. What you don't have is like, what's the income in that neighborhood? But you can go get that from the IRS. So you can join in other data sets into the data set you know about. Uh, in recommender systems, which is what typically you're talking about in sales, it's a ranking problem. It's like, what prospect should I hit first? And you can bootstrap that very quickly. So recommender systems are designed. If you look up on the internet, the cold start problem, this is a well-known problem where like, you don't have data yet on either your sales guy or his customer, but how quickly can you pigeonhole stuff to like just get stuff going? Um, and this has been well-studied for like forever, but the high-level idea is you can actually start somewhere with AI because you can build up a data set that's approximate that just gets better and better. Think of it like um, when you're learning how to do something. 
you do it better and better and better over time. Over time. And that's and as long as you go in knowing that is yeah. the point you know, process I'm getting at. And you can drill down and say, you know, you know, your AI, whose data is it using? You know, so at what point does it become effective and applicable to me in, in my application yeah. of it? All right. Uh, last, and then we'll leave it here because there's lots more we can do. People use the term AI all the time. But, you know, as I got here, a lot of times it's just rules-based, and that's yeah. not AI. A lot of times it's predictive analytics or machine learning. Like, you know... What is AI versus these other aspects? They're claiming to be AI, but they're not. So some of it is fair to have different terms for it. For example, some we were talking to someone in law enforcement, and they were like, if you want me to turn people's pockets inside out, you better tell me why. And sometimes the AI that we use, like deep learning, you don't know why. So it's fair to say, like, interpretable machine learning or not. So some of these, like, distinctions in terminology mean something. But when people say just like big picture AI, eh, like whether it's like a regression tree or deep learning or kind of who cares, that's the nerd problem. Yep. The businessy problem is like, does it adapt when I get more data or not? If no amount of more data will make the thing better, either you didn't need AI or it's not AI. So that's a brilliant takeaway. I want to stop you there. We're running out of time. So we're going to keep this party going. Just a recap on on, uh, on our whole discussion on AI. We've talked about why you need it and how you can apply it. We've talked about how there's different AI for different applications, and then you can start using them in combinations, and it gets kind of cool. But the AIs will only ever be as good as the data set you have, of course. Uh, we've talked about AI being a, a tool. It's not a replacement. It's an adjunct to what you're already doing. It can optimize certain capabilities, but it's not the savior. For yeah. lack of a better word. That's right. Uh, let's talk about on the beware the hype and do your due diligence. You know, whether it's claims being made by a vendor, uh, capabilities they have that they don't have, you can check on, or it being things like uh, scope creep, all right, or being things like, you know, they're just, they're so distributed, you can't actually get together to do what you need to do to figure out how to make it all work. All that you can validate against, but you gotta be conscious about it. You gotta call the vendor out on that. Um, and finally, the whole idea that, you know, manage your expectations around AI. Don't hesitate to call out the vendor and say, how does this matter to me? Give me the specifics, all right? Because that's important. If, for example, you can say, when I buy this product, you know, at what point will it really start working for me? When my, will my data set be tangible? And I love your point that if it's not always improving and, and adjusting, then it's not AI. Yeah. Right? And that's that's a huge difference. So that's kind of cool. All right. So with that, what I want to do is I want to bring this on and I want to say, do we have any questions? And we only had one question. Actually, we had multiple come in, but you answered some. The one that came in very quickly was a lot of software vendors claim to have AI baked into their solutions. How can you spot vendors using real AI, just some fancy algorithms? And we talked about the reference checks already. Is there anything yeah. else you can do? Um, I want to mention it doesn't <coughs> matter. If you like the feature, does it matter if it really uses AI? Powerful that, statement. As long as it affects you, that's what you want. You're, you're, you're shopping for the benefit. Yeah, cut through the marketing and say, like, does this benefit me? Right. All right. So there you go. Does it matter? I like that answer. All right. So with that, I do believe we are fundamentally out of time. If you've not met Daniel... He's right here. He's with LeMay AI. As Hola. we talked about before, definitely give him a shout on LinkedIn and uh, on Twitter because he's quite active. Uh, and, I, and give him grief. I give him grief all the time when I do it. And that's what I would tell you to do as well. So the thing is, if you're watching this on demand, his email address is right there on the slide. Don't hesitate. Give him a shout. Similarly, give me a shout. We can carry on the conversation offline. So those are the things that you need to know here right now. With that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to thank my good friend, Daniel. Thank you so much for coming today. And thank you. This has been fun. I've had a good time. It goes by really, really fast. Technology is always a bit of a hit and miss. So, so far today has worked out pretty well for us. With that, folks, we are out of here. We are done. So what we're going to do is we're going to wrap it up and we're going to say to you, thanks for joining us today. We're going to come back to you very soon. And in the meantime, we wish you a very pleasant day. Take care, folks. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.